thank you, Dalia. Thanks a lot for that uh, kind introduction. Um, very happy to be here, and I'm uh, going to be leading this panel with a very eminent group of um, panelists uh, that I will briefly introduce, and then I would appreciate if they uh, provide a little more intro when uh, they're responding to questions as well. Um, so I have with myself uh, Dr. Awesome Padella, who's a professor and vice chair for research and scholarship at the Medical College of Wisconsin. Uh, he's an emergency medicine specialist and uh, also does a lot of research in the arena of bioethics. Uh, I have Dr. Adil Sayed, who is the chief executive officer of um, CEO of Umma Clinic, which is a Muslim free clinic network. Um, and I also have Imam Do uh, Dr. Kaiser uh, Abdullah, who is an assistant professor in the communication and social influence department in Klein College of Media and Communication at Temple University. He also serves as an Imam in Chicago. Um, I will uh, also allow them to uh, go delve a little deeper into their background when they're uh, responding to questions as well. Um, uh, Adalia already introduced me, uh, so I will uh, dive into and give you a little bit of an introduction of um, my organization and also uh, the sort of the plan that we have for the discussion today, which I promise you is going to be very interesting. So I serve on the board for American Muslim Health Professionals, uh, just as um, uh, just as Dahlia mentioned, and this is a public health organization uh, for Muslim health professionals to in effect work for improving the health care for all, uh, all Americans in the U.S. So uh, we, we try to advance health care across the board. We just provide a platform for Muslim professionals from different sectors of healthcare. We're not specific to physicians. We welcome all professionals with public health backgrounds, nursing backgrounds, all the different aspects of healthcare. So this really ties into like our talk today. And it's important to mention that we bring people together from different areas because public health is an overarching term. It includes uh, not just the regular health care that we think about when we think about health and going to a hospital, but it also speaks to the, um, to the, the different social and economic factors that we have uh, over and beyond. So it, that delves into more prevention, the social determinants of healthcare, the, the mental health of uh, our, our community as well, where every day we're, we're talking about how preventative measures in that arena, it's more important than, uh, than anything else. And also sometimes it goes into um, the criminal justice system and how it ties into mental health and all these complicated areas uh, tying together public health, social just justice, all of this and social determinants of health, we will be talking about the, the integration of all of this and how we need to have legislation and civic engagement within our communities uh, to improve this. Um, because health policy is, is a defining part of why our healthcare, um, of the changes that we need in our healthcare. So, so, so it's a very complicated uh, uh, topic, it seems, but I assure you uh, with our speakers, it will be um, a very engaging conversation. Uh, we will be centering on the health policy areas that we will have worked on today. We will also be discussing um, the areas within health policy where we need to work collectively as Americans and, and also talk about areas of need within the, the, the Muslim community itself when it comes to healthcare, which I think is a very interesting concept that we haven't really talked about. And, um, and in that sense, we will discuss also the work that uh, American Muslim health professionals, as we, uh, um, from a health policy standpoint, we try to center our work uh, in uh, health policy. And that includes, and I will touch on the various areas of health policy that we've worked in as we uh, have our discussion. To begin things, uh, I'm gonna have an open question for all of the panelists, um, at, primarily to discuss uh, what is a particular area of health policy in which they have worked on, and how? Um, what do you? What do they think um, are the particular legislative needs or bills or 
the work that is needed in the field in general. I'm going to start with Dr. Awesome Padella, and Dr. Padella has done some very interesting research in this field as well, which highlights an area of need. And if Dr. Padella, you could speak more to that as well, we would appreciate it. Handing it to you, Dr. Padella. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be amongst you today, and I want to congratulate um, the organizations that have put this together. Uh, I am really looking forward to continuing to participate in this conversation. I think we're outlining very important things for our community, but also for the broader American population. So thank you for the opportunity. So with that, I'll, I'll share a little bit about uh, the healthcare policy agenda and American Muslims from the lens where I sit. As you've heard <clears throat> that I am a professor of emergency medicine biotechs at the Medical College of Wisconsin, but what we didn't hear is that I'm also the director of the Initiative of Islamic Medicine, which has been in this domain for about a decade. So let me begin with Spinoza al This is the approach of the Initiative of Islamic Medicine over the last decade, where we do research at the intersection between Islamic tradition, biomedicine, and Muslim practices. We conduct theological, empirical, and bioethical research in two main areas, one of which uh, is around Muslim clinicians. This is one I've been asked to speak specifically about today, and I'll give you some data from there. But we are thinking about how the religious identity of Muslim physicians interfaces with their work environment, particularly in the academy the types of discrimination that they might experience, the types of biological challenges that they face. The other main arm of work is around how Islam animates the health behaviors and the experiences of Muslim patients, right? And that work is centered around mosque communities where 50% of Muslim Americans aggregate. The community is not just the center of the masjid, but the social network around that masjid. And our work is rooted in that sort of way in a community age lens. The hope of all that is to create a culture of health in masjid communities, right? attentive and informative notions of health and how that relates to being a Muslim. The other area of sort of intervention work is around education, where our work informs right, teaching tools to accommodate and think about Muslim identity in the healthcare environment so that the general community of healthcare providers are more learned and more nuanced in the way they approach and communicate with Muslim patients. The other two domains, which speak more particularly to this conference today, are around advancing diversity, equity, and health, uh, and health equity and inclusion in the workplace environment, a conversation where Muslim Americans are largely left out for various reasons I'll share in a moment, and then it actually inform policy, right? So conversations around conscious and religious freedom from an Islamically rooted, theologically sound lens, right? Where we can participate in conversations from our own tradition, bring our moral values to the tapestry of this country. So let me now, with that background, kind of give you a sense of where we reside with Muslims in the healthcare context, particularly as it relates to health policy. Now, I would argue that we are in the realm of known unknowns and unknown knowns. Known unknowns meaning things that we know we don't know. And one of the major issues is that we do not know aggregate Muslim American health status and outcomes. We do not know that at a national level, unlike other communities. And there are reasons for that. And the reasons for that mainly are the fact that the National Healthcare Quality and Disparities Reports are authorized by Congress to, and the National Health Surveys that are now funded by various foundations and institutions to not include religious affiliation. Right? They, they foreground the religious and, eth I mean, sorry, the ethnic and racial identity and the socioeconomic identity because they believe those sorts of features uh, allow individuals to have the same health behaviors, beliefs, and experiences. Yet religious identity is sublimated and, and not thought about as overlooked or marginalized. So even in the health agenda plans for improving health equity, the 2020 and now the 2030 plan from HHS and HRQ, religious features are not prominent. This influences the research that we do. So this last bit here is from a, about now a decade ago, but a med student uh, of mine did some research around what healthcare research, health disparity research is occurring in most American communities. We found over 50 years as it's a small amount of work, but even the work in Muslim communities or around Muslim communities were focused on racial identities like Arabs and South Asians. They did not include by and large religious data, right? And so metrics of religiosity and how they influence health behaviors. So the lens that we adopt to do research from our own communities also has racialized, right? Or ethnicized sort of identities, not thinking about the thing that common brings us together, which is our religious identity. So that's the known unknowns. And the other sort of aspect I mentioned is the unknown knowns. Things, right, that we know from lived experience exist, but the larger community doesn't know. I mean, the larger policy world does not know. So for example, we know, and empirical work that we've done in the initial Islam medicine shows that religious beliefs, values, and identity strongly influence health behaviors and practices of Muslim Americans across racial, ethnic, socioeconomic, and geographic lines. That being Muslim by in and of itself 
is more important than these racial, ethnic, and social ethnic identities for health behavior and health behavior change, right? But the larger world doesn't know that, right? And we don't, again, for various reasons, as I mentioned. The other thing we know is that patient level health and healthcare inequities result from inadequate attention to the religious dimensions of health. This is a model, and I can share with you later on our work, um, but shows how Islamic identity, right, Islamic values and beliefs influence the, your healthcare patterns and the healthcare disparities that exist in the community. Again, if you don't research that, we neglect it, and the larger community, I mean, the policymakers we want to talk to, don't know about it. And this has several areas of our work. I'll just share a couple of statistics. Delayed healthcare seeking due to concordance. We found over 50% of most Americans, men and women, right, report delaying seeking healthcare because they cannot find a provider that's of the same uh, sex, right? Poor adherence to cancer screening guidelines. We did work around mammography, a five year prize in Chicagoland. One third, uh, sorry, yeah, one third of Muslim American women were not getting age appropriate cancer screening, right? We found worse health outcomes to discrimination. This is one of the first papers that we did was on post 9-11 discrimination abuse before we had the term Islamophobia, which found mental health outcomes amongst Muslims were worse just because of the discrimination bias that they were experiencing. And then end of life care health tensions, and I'll leave that for Q&A. But here, really, the particular notions about how to die faithfully are not attended to by the hospice palliative care systems that we have today in the United States. So I was asked to speak about the Muslim clinician arm. So I'll share a few data points and then I'll, I'll let my, 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 my panelists, co-panelists, who I'm uh, glad to be on this panel with uh, speak. But this is a decade long of work that's funded by various organizations in partnership with Imana and AMHP who's, who's putting this panel on today. So I wanted to share with you a few data points for your reflection right, from our work. And, and the unknown known here is this, that Muslim clinicians experience religious discrimination, adverse personal and professional outcomes due to poor accommodation of their religious identity in the healthcare workplace. That is a known or unknown known. We know that, but it's our duty for a policy agenda to think about how to bring that to the external world. So here are some statistics which should be alarming. From our 2013 national survey of Muslim physicians to the 2021 replication of that national survey, you can think about what was happening in the social political climate, but you'll see this first marker here, just the frequency of experiencing resistance discrimination at workplace over your career course. At the, that time in 2013, 25% said often always or sometimes, but now over 50% of physicians nationally. And this letter 2021 sample is just in the academy, right? We're experiencing discrimination. Were they experiencing discrimination currently, presently at that time? 14% in 2013, but now 36% were experiencing discrimination at that time. And do they believe that they were passed over professional advancement because of their religion? So initially, again, in 2013, you know, only 25% or so said yes, but now over 50% are saying that they believe they're passed over because of their religious identity leaving a job for workplace discrimination, 7% in 2013, 32% today, right? The, the religious identity places them at greater screening for work, uh, at the workplace, 50% both times, right? Or they report struggling to find accommodation for prayer at work, 50% or more on both times. And now from, this is institutional, but from the patient level, right? A 9% in 2013 said patients have refused their, their care because of the religious identity of the physician. Over a third are now reporting this. And I can give you more data points. This is absolutely alarming data around how Muslim clinicians are experiencing their work environment. And I'll share with you that many leave the environment because of that. So that data is coming out and I'll, I can talk about that later. But just to give you a sense of another outcome about depression, right? We're in the middle of the great resignation. And oftentimes we believe our religiosity buffers that effect. So 47% of our samples screen positive on a public uh, for depression, 47%. Right? And intrinsic religiosity did buffer against that. So you see the odds ratio is 0.69. But believing your religion, religion is the most important feature of your identity, you had a five times greater odds of having depression. So there's a much complex, nuanced notion here what's happening with our religiosity in the workplace environment. So what does this all mean? Right? Some of it patient level, certain, some of it physician level or clinician level. Muslims are highly visible, right? They're visible by their features, but invisible in data streams. So we're subject to the adverse aspects of having explicit religiosity, and we do not get the benefits of equal attention to ameliorate the health conditions and work environment factors that, uh, that, that make the healthcare environment worse for us, right? So this example is what I just gave you around the clinician, but also patient level, right? So if a patient discloses that they're Muslim at the encounter when they're getting into the hospital setting, it only opens them to discrimination. There is no package of benefits that they get Muslim chaplain understanding of the religious notions of how to pray and we'll do uh, guidelines, none of that do they get. So there's no need to disclose for them and it's only a bad thing if they do so. 
A Muslim health policy agenda remains in the unknown, unknown domain, right? So we don't have, I would argue, Asim Padella, that we not we have policy advocacy, but it's not attentive to the Muslim dimensions of health values and for health care delivery. What's unique and significant about the Muslim experiences? And then do the Islamic ideals don't reach the marketplace of health policy. And there's some papers on that. And I'll give you an example that that, that study right here, it was just by not a Muslim organization. I was glad to be part of that work was about how the Muslim ban affected Somali Americans interaction with the healthcare environment in Minnesota. That work clearly foregrounds the Muslim identity, but it is done by those external to us, right? And we need to think and own that work because it informs health policy in the end. So what is the initial Islamic medicine organization I, I lead doing? So we're capacity building for data streams and thought leadership to address this situation, right? We want to make the unknown knowns and the known unknowns into known knowns. So we design and implement mosque-based health disparity research and intervention work. We convene multidisciplinary working groups to mine the moral tradition to inform bioethics and health policy conversations. We equip community leaders and activists with the tools to develop their own health needs assessments in their communities, educational interventions, and grant partnerships. And the goal of this and why you're partnering here or participating here, what I am so inspired by this group is that we want to initiate an ecosystem for environmental improvement and policy change right, with all of your leadership. There. So we want to use data on our met needs and challenges to drive policy recommendations, to advocacy and partnership with others. So just I want to end now, right? So these are some of this is some of the work at the initial Islam medicine, you can go to medicineislam.org to look at that. But I want to give you a sense of it's the most specific work we're doing. We developed the religious intervention for mammography, their toolkits and replication guides for you to uptake that, right? We did an RCT on informing Muslim Americans around organ donation because there were disparities there. And we created a religious sort of guide for decision making based on the plurality within the ethical tradition and the plurality within the medical knowledge around organ donation. We engaged Muslim Americans. This was a capacity building a project which led to a research agenda, right? We did Delphi, a modified Delphi method to think about the top Muslim healthcare concerns for disparities and create a toolkit for communities to uptake and implement that sort of research paradigm within their own uh, settings. And our recent study is around the unmet Muslim American health and spiritual needs in hospital settings, which will come out. And I just do want to mention that over a decade ago, I, we were part of the ISP to create a, 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 uh, a policy report. And some of the work from what you just heard today will come in some other domains as well. So the end of my, my call and my for us is that we have to highlight the invisible nature of Muslim health disparities and equities and challenges, right? We have to garner representative data sources to identify the unmet needs and religion related factors that address those needs deeply integrated Islamic moral frameworks into policy visions so that we are empowering work, it's asset-based work, it's religiously rooted research and intervention. Thank you for the time and I appreciate the grace from my co-panelists. Thank you, Dr. Padella. A very complicated topic, so of course it takes a little bit longer and it is definitely an area of need and this is what I was alluding to that we will discuss areas where we still need work to be done. Uh, I would argue that, of course, the Muslim community should lead the way and make this uh, known that we need to have um, to need to implement these types of uh, changes in the healthcare system. But it's also imperative that hospitals and other healthcare organizations also recognize this individual need. And I, research is generally a pathway for change uh, in healthcare. So. Uh, hopefully that this will lead to some additional change. I will mention one uh, element of the work that Muslim uh, American Muslim health professionals have done in this area because we started um, a, a health equity arm as well um, about a year and a half ago. And we were trying to discuss health equity from various angles. And one of the things that we did do was a, a patient um, a patient advocate driven panel in which a, a, a South Asian uh, patient uh, who had what she calls dodged breast cancer discussed the importance of doing mammograms. Um, and we did open it up to all communities because there are um, intersections with other conservative religions where the uptake of doing mammograms is low. But she did speak to her personal experience and also delved into her religious background to explain how she overcame or she used religion to under, uh, understand the importance of doing a mammogram on time and how uh, useful or helpful it was. So, so there is some work, but to, to your point, definitely there is a lot more that needs to be done. And I think this is a very nice segue to our next uh, 
panelists to, to jump in and describe that the health policy uh, related work and public health work that Dr. Adil Sayed is doing. And it's very interesting because Dr. Padella talked about the needs of the Muslim uh, health professionals and Dr. Adil will talk about uh, the, the work that Muslim health professionals are doing, especially in the realm of Muslim free clinics. And uh, Dr. Adil, if you could also speak um, to, to a little bit about your own background a little more if I left out anything. And I'm not calling you Dr. Sayed because I will feel like I'm talking to myself. So <laughs> you can you can jump in, please. Sure, thank you so much. And again, I uh, wanna thank uh, the organizers, uh, my co-panelists, the previous panel, which I think had a lot of implications for the work that's happening in the health equity space as well. Um, Dr. Padella as well, a chance of knowing for a few decades. Um, so yeah, you know, at uh, UMA Community Clinic, as you may have uh, known, you know, we were the first uh, federally qualified health center started by American Muslims uh, in the United States. Uh, we were a free clinic, transitioned to a FQHC, and there have been, uh, alhamdulillah, many other FQHCs who have come about uh, across the United States serving very diverse populations, uh, uh, you know, in, in rural and urban areas as well, and health, tackling health disparities. Uh, and I think one area that's unique to my comments as you know, compared to perhaps Dr. Padella is the work uh, I think American Muslims are doing in the health safety net uh, at large. And I think um, you know, if you look at different states, obviously we understand healthcare is a very uh, dynamic institution with a lot of peculiarities to specific states and what's happening with Medicaid expansion, Medicare across <clears throat> the health safety net, I think has been a natural place where many uh, Muslim physicians, those in the health space have uh, tried to increase their um, ability to give back, right? Whether it be the local free clinic started by the local masajid, whether it be a group of physicians who are seeing uh, patients for pro bono care. And so to that same end, you know, Ummah Clinic started its efforts in the eight, early 1990s, and it was actually started by a group of American Muslim medical students. I think the unique aspect about UMA is that um, over, you know, 99% uh, of our patients are not from the Muslim community. We are servicing the needs of the local South LA community as well. And I think those efforts across the board um, have really increased, again, in different free clinics, federally qualified health centers that have come out in the United States. Uh, kind of fast forwarding to where we are today, you know, we have over 30,000 patient visits. Uh, now uh, we are caring for uh, roughly 12 to 13,000 individual patients in South LA. Um, and we have really a truly integrated model of healthcare that includes primary care, behavioral health, and dental staff. Um, and that's delivered by over 80 uh, full time staff members at the clinic. And I think if we look at some of the priorities that were um, mentioned by Dr. Mujahid earlier uh, from ISPU, healthcare continues to rank amongst one of the highest priorities for American Muslims. Uh, when looking at either in terms of, you know, the policy preferences, but also in terms of their own health and their own choices that Dr. Padella talked about, but also about in terms of service and giving back to the community at, uh, at large as well. And so I think one area that we really, really stepped into is to one, share our work and our model with other communities. And two, as Dr. Sayed also, Sana Sayed spoke about is the social determinants of health. So I wanted to briefly mention what we're doing there. Uh, we understand that food insecurity is tied uh, to um, physical health uh, very closely. And so we run a, uh, a clinic on the campus of John C. Fremont High School in South LA, where we do a free farmer's market and we give out free fr fruits and vegetables. And so on a yearly basis, we're touching 29,000 families and over 400,000 pounds of food that's given out to local community members and organizations and really going upstream to really address the work that's happening as well. And lastly, I want to share, uh, you know, going back to some of the social justice implications and, uh, you know, the prison, the school to prison pipeline system and where American Muslims are, uh, you know, doing work there. You know, again, being on the campus of John C. Fremont High School in South L.A., uh, we've worked with the school, with the local police, um, um, uh, you know, union and, you know, their presence is also very visible on, on, the, on, on campuses across Los Angeles Unified School District to help to create restorative justice practices where you know, punitive damages for children uh, and they're not getting placed into that school or prison pipeline early on uh, in their lives and accessing you know, mentors through our student health leaders program and other areas as well. So I think this overall network of increasing Muslim um, visibility in the safety net healthcare, and we see that over 5% of uh, 
American Muslim physicians in the United uh, in physicians in the United States are uh, identif self identify as being Muslim, and with you know representation of less than one percent of the population, and in twenty fifty we're going to be close to eight point one million uh, American Muslims in the United States, and so that's the type of uh, I think large uh, you know critical mass that we need to push these issues forward. Um, safe, health safety net and issues around health and you know health and wellness have been continuing to increase. There are wonderful models out there. I extend an invitation to you all to look at Uma's model. I'm happy to share our best practices. And if you're looking to start that work in your community and step into the safety net, uh, very much looking forward to help as well. And I think in addition to the work in terms of our internal community, what's happening with the Initiative on Islam and Medicine, also understanding how American Muslims are impacting the health safety net in the United States. So thank you for that. So thank you, Dr. Otto. That was um, that was an excellent overview of a lot of different issues, and I think also a very excellent segue to our next panelist. Um, at, towards the end, I will also try to go over the different um, legislation in these various areas that everybody talked about that American Muslim Health Professionals has also worked in. Uh, but I do want to jump to Dasher Imam uh, Kaiser now, uh, because he's doing very interesting cross-sectional work that ch touches both the criminal justice system and mental health and both of the topics that our previous speakers have just talked about. And he um, is really working at the ground level on these, uh, in these areas. And uh, I think uh, listening to his experience would be very intriguing as well. And it ties together this panel in a very nice way. Um, and really, really is a good um, segue uh, to sort of uh, bring this full circle. So Dr. Imam Kayser. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, as Dr. Sana mentioned, my name is Kaiser Abdullah. I am situated, one slight correction, um, situated in, the, in Philadelphia as opposed to Chicago. Um, so the work that I <laughs> the work that I do in, um, in Philadelphia, so when Dr. Sana introduced me, when Dr. Sana introduced me, I'm like, oh, she wants me to focus on this as opposed to that. So I'm going to do a bit of modification here just to highlight some of the areas in which um, some of the experiences that I, I work with. So to connect to what Dr. Syed and uh, Dr. Perella shared earlier on, you know, there's a lot that has been happening around health equity, right? And when you think of equity, as everyone here on the panel was, as was eloquently introduced, um, it really is about this idea of removing barriers. So one of the things that has happened very intentionally um, since the pandemic is this inclusion, and I think Dr. Perello is alluding to it, right? This inclusion of religious identity and religious communities in this conversation around health outcomes. Right? That, I, I think certain communities and certain state agencies have been very intentional about that. And I'll just give you one example. Um, maybe in late 2020, um, Pennsylvania in particular, they, they put together this health health equity action team. Um, I am um, on the health equity action team and what it looks at, it brings in people who are representative of health systems, um, community organizers, uh, religious leaders, um, basically anyone who is involved in creating healthier communities. And all of these folks have gathered together, although it came out of the, um, although it came out of, as a result of the pandemic, which really brought some of these inequities to life. And there's this idea of, bringing together professionals, people who are engaging the community members on the ground level from the research perspective or from research perspective or from direct care or direct services perspective to help them come together to figure out what does it mean to create a more equitable health system or equitable health communities for all of us. Uh, one of the other things that came out of that and I'm going to move into, I think, what Dr. Sana wants you to speak on uh, shortly. One of the other things that we did in this period was the Black, um, the Black Muslim COVID Coalition, right? That was something that we looked at, what does it mean to be a Black Muslim experiencing COVID at this time? What things do you have access to? What things are speaking to you? What things are, uh, uh, um, are distant from you? And is the conversation around your health really present in the national conversation around how do we, how do we navigate this issue? 
And the last thing I'm going to touch on in this, so I, I really am still speaking about the pandemic and what it has created and how some of these things have really been brought to life. One of the other things that came out was this, um, was the COVID prevention network, right, that really brought together a number of religious leaders, some of them carry the title of imams, and black doctors, right, black Muslim doctors, who came together to speak about what does it mean to actually navigate the COVID pandemic in this time, but also, and more specifically, what does it mean when we look at the data on, um, on black Muslims who, or black people in general, which by and large affects black Muslims, right, who are impacted by the COVID disease at higher rates than, their, um, than other races or ethnic groups and have lower instances of vaccination when compared to other groups. So this COVID, um, COVID um, prevention network, what we actually got together was how do we come about removing that barrier of misinformation that prevents Muslims from accessing certain medical health resources, right? So that they can be in better health spaces. So these are just three areas where we actually did some work directly targeted to what does it mean to remove barriers to create um, areas for black Muslims to access better health outcomes, better health resources. In particular, um, when we, if we are taking a very broad look at what does um, public health, right, and public health um, is absolutely, or violence is absolutely tied to public health, one of the things that I am directly involved in is many of us are familiar, and this ties into something that Dalia said earlier on in the previous one, right? Many of us are familiar with the Plainview Project. And the Plainview Project is um, a, a project that, came, that looked at what are police departments around the United States doing, or, or it looks at Facebook posts pertaining to um, police departments around the United States and how they engage in Islamophobia, anti-Black racism, xenophobia, homophobia, and a lot of other types of phobias, right, that targeted marginalized communities. And without going into too much of this, um, in Pennsylvania, there's something called Act 111, right? And Act 111 basically gives police officers the right to arbitration. Um, this is somewhat tied to qualified immunity, but it's, it's different. So essentially, Act 111 says that if a police officer is disciplined, what they're allowed to do is to seek arbitration. And arbitration, the outcome of the arbitration is binding. So as a result of the PNG project, many police officers were disciplined, whether it be a written, uh, a, a written notice, suspension, or dismissal. Because of Act 111, they are, they are entitled to arbitration. So therefore, when they go through arbitration, it means that an arbitrator can decide that this police officer, although they were relieved from duty by the city, if the arbitrator decides that no, they should be allowed back on the force, the department has no recourse but to bring them back on. So imagine someone who says Muslims should be banned from the United States. And that's a really key thing that they may have said in one of these posts. Muslims should be banned, right? Or the best Muslim is a dead Muslim, right? Think of things like that. They say this, say repeatedly, share comments on this, get dismissed, and then in arbitration, they get brought back onto the force. That creates a, 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 a serious distrust between the community and can absolutely impact how Muslims in Philadelphia and how people, black people in Philadelphia in general, um, interact with, with police officers and can actually cause an escalation in violence because of this lack of trust. What we found is that um, I come in there as uh, during these arbitration proceedings, proceedings, I come in there as an um, expert witness is what they identify us as. And what we speak about is how this, how violence or verbal aggression that is rooted in bias, how that can actually lead to violence against marginalized people in the community, particularly Muslims, particularly people who identify as black and other marginalized identities. Um, thus far, we have prepped for about six different cases, and I've testified in about three or four of these cases. The reason why I'm highlighting this is, um, if we understand violence to be intimately tied to the larger discussion of public health, and we understand that there are, there are agents that are um, entitled to engage in, in state-sponsored or, or violence, against communities or against uh, marginalized communities, then we can see why our intervention as Muslim experts, as Muslim leaders, leaders in these spaces can actually create better outcomes for health and mental health in our community. 
Uh, the last thing I want to say on this, um, just to wrap up this PC, and then um, Sonny, you can tell me if we, if I should just leave this for the next PC. Here, is outside of my work as at Temple University, outside of my work as a religious leader, one thing that I do through um, through another business that I'm part of is this idea of um, creating skills and working with individuals to develop the skills that they need to become better um, contributing members of society. So as Dr. Said, Dr. Adel mentioned earlier on, right? Um, when we look at health outcomes and how food insecurity is tied to, um, to, to how people function inside of their communities, one of the things that we realize is that when folks don't have the skills, when they don't have the, 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 the ability to either work to get, the, um, to get the resources that they need or to purchase the, the, the types of food and sustenance that they need, that this can actually lead to different types of problems for them, their families, and, the, and their communities that they are part of. So one of the things that, we, that Philadelphia has been very intentional about is figuring out ways to, to give opportunities so members of the marginalized community here in Philadelphia to develop different types of skills. Right? They generally call it workforce development. Um, that term is falling out of favor. So if you see me avoiding it, it's because uh, many folks are, are struggling with using this idea of workforce development. But giving them the skills so that they themselves can make better choices when it comes to or have the resources to therefore make different, I should say better, make different choices when it comes to how do they want to interact with others in the community, how they want to interact with people who with law enforcement, and how do they want to interact with even their own um, healthcare and medical professionals. So those are just three of the areas that I find myself working in that help bring some of this work that we've been talking about together so far. Thanks to you so much, uh, Imam Dr. Abdullah. And sorry for mixing up your location. I made you into a flying Imam, flying, mm -hmm. <laughs> even though I know that Temple University is in Philadelphia. I don't know why Chicago was on my mind. <laughs> Maybe I thought you were close to Dr. Padella somehow. So, <laughs> I, uh, no, but thank you so much. As you can see, our speakers have such a diverse background and they are doing so many things all at once that is even impossible to <laughs> encompass it in one small talk. I mean, Dr. Abdullah just gave you a very bare minimum of what he's doing, quite frankly, as far as I can, I can tell. Uh, but he tried his best to like highlight all the areas and do feel free to reach out to our speakers if they are okay with it to discuss further if they can uh, augment or help you with your work or you know collaborate with you i do want to say a few words about the the variety of things that everybody talked about um so uh i'm very grateful that uh dr abdullah brought up uh, the black muslim covid coalition uh because um american muslim health professionals and a number of org other organizations including ispu islamic relief and many many more islam uh imana and all we came together and we also created a national black muslim uh, the national muslim covid task force as well and we did work very closely with the Black Muslim COVID coalition as well. Now, you would wonder, why would we separate it out? But I think it is very important to recognize that even within our own community, sometimes we have problems, not sometimes, a lot of times we have problems with the representation. Um, so we really wanted to ensure that we have a collaborative um, effort. So we're, of course, even within the National Muslim Task Force, there were people from all backgrounds, all organizations, but to ensure that the, the voices are heard in an equitable manner, we also made it a point to work with the Black Muslim Coed Coalition as well. And I think that was a phenomenal effort. And the, I would say the Muslim community was very well organized in that effort. Uh, one of the things that we worked on um, in terms of just uh, health policy, since that is the topic of the day, is that uh, I was a co-chair for the, the policy committee of the National Muslim uh, Task Force as well. And we uh, worked on key pieces of legislation. Um, I, some of our speakers, or rather all of our speakers today also do a lot of groundwork. Uh, our work was focused more uh, in the background on uh, policy and legislation and supporting certain bills and also um, using the many capabilities within the Muslim, um, Muslim community 
for advocacy and lobbying. And we came together with a variety of organizations that traditionally are not working in the health policy space. I would mention like MPAC, Imana, MGAGE. We worked with them to uh, support pieces of legislation like the TRACE Act, which in particular uh, focused on improving uh, COVID testing and treatment and access in minority communities. And we all know the disparate impact as Dr. Uh, Abdullah mentioned in uh, the black and Latino communities, for instance. So those bills were specifically targeting there. Uh, more recently, we've also supported the HEAL Act, uh, which is more about immigrants in general, uh, and removing barriers to access to healthcare. Um, access to healthcare, as both Dr. Uh, Adil and Dr. Abdullah mentioned, and even Dr. Padella mentioned, is a key element of why healthcare suffers. And these barriers are very diverse. So one of them is, of course, um, just Medicare, Medicaid, not having sufficient expansion. But then there's also specific barriers for the immigrant community. Um, and the Hill Act is one of those things that we're working on. And when I say we're working on these various acts, I mean, we are trying to engage with the community so that they reach out to the legislators and push for this. We send letters to legislators ourselves, depending on where these various pieces of legislation are. So it's a way to bring improve civic engagement in its entirety. Um, and I will just, one last thing I already mentioned, uh, the health equity arm we created, that that was in particular because of the inequities that became incredibly transparent during COVID. But I will say health equity is a problem for all times. It's not just a COVID problem. I mean, look at the, the, uh, the Black maternal health crisis that we have. And that is another area that AMP is, uh, American Muslim Health Professionals is short for AMP, is working on, for, and the Momnibus Act, which is recently what we've been collaborating with various other organizations on uh, and trying to uh, move that needle forward as well. So I, I do think that one thing that we should think about is that this recent public health crisis that just made uh, the flaws in our healthcare system more apparent should be a call to action for everybody to come to the table and bring their various expertise and even civic engagement as an expertise that uh, to change the way that healthcare is done. So um, that was my spiel, but I did want to go back to the speakers as well. And thank you so much for such a such an engaging conversation. Um, it's unfortunate we're not in person because sometimes that makes the banter easier uh, and we could have been jumping around. Uh, but um, I did want to say like, based on the work that you're doing and some of you've already touched on it, but what do you think is the call to action from your perspective uh, as well? So uh, Dr. Padella will just go the same sequence, putting you on the spot there, but you did kind of touch on a number of things, but if you want to just, you know. Yeah, so Thank you. So for all of you, just go back to the slide. It's probably recorded if I call to action. But I, I, I would argue to connect this panel to the one before, where the one before is saying, what's Muslim identity? I'm bringing my Muslim identity to this space. I'm going to be, uh, Linda was like, not apologetic, but we're going to be epistemically humble. And I do not think that that is possible in the healthcare policy domain unless we have the same notion that my identity must be accounted for. I must be seen when I go into the healthcare system as a marker for data, right? Meaning that Muslim religiosity should be, Islam, religious affiliation should be attached to that. When we do research on communities, we should be thinking about what are the specific unmet Muslim needs. No one will do the work for us, right? We have to do it ourselves. And that's my call. Actually, if you want to change policy, go lobby for policies that allow for religious affiliation within data sets like the census, like the National Health Interview Survey, like whatever. But there is none, and we will be invis invisible to policymakers until we make ourselves visible to them. So no more feel good. We want to participate. It's actually we now in this space of equity and inclusion include our identity, include it as a religious community that is aligned by this affiliation. So I can't say any more clearer than that. Uh, Dr. Adil, I don't know if you want to jump in real quickly. Yeah, absolutely. I think <clears throat> for me, it's when we talk about health equity and all the great work that American Muslim physicians and others in healthcare are doing, and even, you know, community organizers, you know, I started my career off as a community organizer as well are doing is take these solutions 
to the people on the ground, right? They are most impacted. And I'll give you a tangible example. Uh, Medicaid expansion in our state, in many states, still does not allow for the use of telehealth. For who? For underserved community. Everyone access, everyone else has private insurance, can access telehealth, but the ones being restricted from it are underserved communities. So there's a piece of legislation right now at the national level to expand Medicaid access to tele, telephonic visits, to telehealth visits, right? And then also helping to increase broadband access in underserved communities, which oftentimes gets misconstrued to think, oh, everyone has access to broadband as well. Muslim community, us collectively have the resources to challenge that notion and to make sure that, again, if we're talking about equity, it's centered uh, in terms of advocating uh, policies and practices. And I would just say, lastly, I think we have answers about what complete integrated healthcare looks like from our own faith tradition, right? Medicine in our own tradition, as we know, is so integral to mental health, you know, physical health, all, uh, you know, all spiritual health as well, right? And I think there is a need across the board, regardless of religious affiliation, of what an Islamic framework of healthcare in this country look like. Every, every major health, you know, every major faith institution in this country has supplanted a flag of what health equity looks like vis-a-vis -vis hospital systems, right? Where is the Muslim equivalent to the Cedar sinai to the other Seventh-day Adventist health systems? And I think we have to make that push and we have to do it professionally. We have to do it with a health equity lens and we have to do one realizing that this is American Muslim and Islam in action through vis-a-vis -vis health equity and health access. So I think that's my call to action. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Adil. Now, uh, Imam Dr. Abdullah, I think you have a number of call to actions. Uh, but and I'll, just, I think I'll, just, <laughs> I'll just do two. Um, yeah. So I just put something out there that I didn't mention, and I'm glad that everyone spoke about yeah. connection to mental health, right? As somebody in the community who um, does quite a bit of, just before this, um, this panel, I met with a couple online doing some marital relationship coaching intervention stuff, right? Um, and one of the things that we, um, that I, and I was speaking to a therapist, uh, psychologist just before that session, um, one of the things that I, as a call to action for our community is to put a policy in place where um, we, we have funding, we collect money, and this is what um, she was mentioning to me, right? That we, you, we designate a portion of the zakat in each masjid, especially in the, ma in the more marginalized communities, that fund individuals who need help getting mental health resources or access to mental health. One of the things, so um, that's what I already mentioned, when you named it there, right, in terms of, um, of folks who have Medicaid cannot access telehealth. Um, those who have jobs where it's easy for them to leave, to access mental health resources, right, are in a much better position uh, because one, they have the private insurance and they have other things that can allow them to do it, right? Those who are more constrained because of their resources, who need the, um, the telehealth, right, who, who have now been availed of it for various reasons during the past three years and who now need it more, they find that they can access it less. So what would it look like if our communities actually made funding available for Muslims who needed mental health um, support. One, it would help reduce the stigma that many of us know Muslims have against mental health, right? And it's very prevalent in the black and brown community, right? So if we as religious leaders make this a priority that, hey, this is so important, the same way we get food from the share programs and we distribute it to our communities, this is so important that we are actually allowing, we're actually carving out a space where if you know you need the support, you, um, and I know we have different things that we have to navigate around confidentiality, privacy, and, and the stigma that is attached to it. I'm just mapping out the whole policy here, just an idea that we need to make this a priority. And the only way we can make this a priority is if we start allocating resources to it. And what more of a, of a significant way to allocate resources to it than to start looking at money that we actually have to pay in terms of our zakat, what can we do with that to help support this need that we know members of our community absolutely need. So that's the, that's the one thing that, if I, yeah, I'm just going to use that as my one call to action right now. No, thank you so much, um, Dr. Abdullah. That, that was an excellent point. And um, 
I agree wholeheartedly. It's uh, especially when it comes to telemedicine, since I do telemedicine um, as part time uh, as well, and uh, it definitely is a need. And I don't think I am re I reach a lot of patients across the country. But exactly what you said, those are either private pay patients or private insurance patients. So they're definitely not reaching the people that actually may need my services, the people who live in places where they cannot access physicians. So that, that has been my personal experience as well. So, and definitely uh, mental health care access is so tied to telemedicine as well. And it's so unfortunate that that deficit is not being bridged. Uh, when we know what the effects of poor mental health care access can be. So that's a definitely a good point. And I would be remiss if I didn't mention, I think Dr. Abdullah reminded me that the, um, we have American Muslim Health Professionals also has a, a very, very active mental health arm. And we've conducted um, Muslim, uh, we've conducted mental health first aid uh, trainings uh, across the country. And we've also collaborated with uh, the Muslim Student Associations uh, to conduct trainings at various campuses as well. And we've done it as a part of interfaith efforts and, uh, and recently uh, also for the refugee populations, particularly from Afghanistan, as uh, I, everyone might be familiar with. So, so definitely we're trying to do work in this area, but of course a lot more effort is needed. I, I think one important element of uh, the take home from all of this is that all of us bring so much, so many different um, uh, expertise to the table. And we saw this with COVID and we saw this when we created the coalitions within our community, the, the Black Muslim COVID Coalition, the National Muslim Task Force for COVID, that, that we have the capacity to work together and the collaboration uh, when it comes to healthcare and it comes to health policy, and I would argue policy in general, policy is an arena where you need to work together to make a change. It's not competitive. Your policy does not trump someone else's policy. So if we come together and we make these changes and we are advocates for the changes that we need within our own community, Dr. P as Dr. Padella mentioned, uh, we are our own best advocates. Uh, but we should also advocate for each other in that sense. So it's an advocation, uh, it's advocating for the community in general. So I do think that um, that is the, the, the message and you can really see today, like with the different panelists, uh, the variety of expertise and the different areas that they work in, yet they are uh, uh, intertwined with each other and overlapping because uh, healthcare does not occur in, a, in an, an isolated framework. It is extremely interconnected. So everything that anyone does, you are touching someone else's work and lives in that. So I think that is a very important thing when it comes to healthcare. Um, I think we um, we had a lot to say, so I don't think we have um, time per se for further questions, but I would encourage you to reach out to the speakers as well, uh, because uh, I would say that they were not able to fully get into uh, what uh, the, the depth of the work that they're doing. And also feel free to reach out to me if you want to work with American Muslim health professionals in any of these areas. Uh, we always welcome volunteers and we welcome your expertise. I will mention that within the health equity arm, we're also publishing. Uh, so we welcome students. Uh, we published in the American Journal of Bioethics and we had a number of posters at the American uh, Public Health Association as well. So we welcome co collaborations like that as well. Um, so I don't think there are any questions, but let me quickly check. I don't think so, and not in the chat as well. So with that, I will uh, wrap up this session. And thank you so much to all of the speakers, not to, <laughs> not to forget that. Thank you so much, excellent discussion. And